This is the Roots and All podcast, and I'm your host, Sarah Wilson. Join me as I talk about all aspects of gardening with some of the top horticulturists from around the world. This episode is brought to you by Sew and Mo. Launched this year, Sew and Mo is a new lawn care brand bringing the right products and expertise to give everyone the confidence to be a lawn expert. They've developed the perfect 12-month plan through six liquid feeds to give your lawn all the nutrients needed for complete plant health and professional results. Packaged into a one-size-fits-all box, lasting 6, 12 or 24 months based on the lawn size, it has the ability to cater for all lawns with no waste. As a special offer for listeners, Sew and Mow is offering 15% off your first box. Simply visit sewandmow.com and enter the code ROOTS15 at checkout. This week I'm speaking to Jessica Walliser, author of Plant Partners, Science-Based Companion Planting Strategies for the Vegetable Garden, which, as it says, is a scientific look at companion planting to find out if it works, and if it does, in what way and why. This book is unique and it's essential reading if you'd like to uncover some of the secrets behind the received horticultural wisdom that's passed down from one gardener to the next. What do we now know about companion planting that maybe hasn't been known previously? That's an excellent question. You know, we've we've heard about companion planting for generations. It's been a thing, but it's been a thing that's really been based in folklore and conjecture. And so it, it's changed a lot now that we have the science to back it up. Um, so I would say probably the biggest thing that we know now that we didn't know several generations ago is the way that plants interact with each other and the way that they impact the way their neighbors grow. Um, and I think that sort of all of the science that's out there right now on mycorrhizal relationships and fungal associations underground and the way plants connect and communicate with each other, I think that's the biggest thing that we can play to our advantage in the vegetable garden. Um, and that really has changed the face of what companion planting really is. Mm. I mean, if you think about it, how amazing that people were so observant that they noticed kind of random plant associations produced good results and other ones didn't uh, without knowing you know kind of almost acting on instinct rather than knowing the science behind it. Yeah and you know I have to say too though Sarah that some of the um, sort of often recommended companion plant partnerships ones that are you know have been around for a very long time you know they they're, they were used, they were recommended, but there wasn't the science behind them and there still isn't the science behind them, which I thought was interesting because I thought, okay, well, geez, people have been doing these forever. So there has to be, you know, a reason that why they work, why people continue to use them. And when I really dug in and tried to find the studies looking at those partnerships, I couldn't find many of them that worked. I did certainly find some that do, uh, but and maybe they were the partnership was recommended for a different reason or you know with the aim of a different result um so some worked and have science behind them and some don't and i thought that was really interesting it is interesting so given that some do work why do they work so they work for a number of different reasons and they work for a number of different goals and so that's sort of what i wanted to do in plant partners i wanted to go through and say hey let's see what all the different benefits of companion planting is. And then let's look at each different um, category and find out which well-studied plant partnerships fit within that category to meet that goal. So the book has seven chapters. There's uh, one on soil preparation and how to use um, companion planting to have better soil. There's one on weed management and how to use companion partnerships for uh, to control weeds. There's one on pest management, which tends to be sort of the most popular companion planting goal. There's one on disease management, one on biological control, and one on pollination. So, you know, we're looking at the goals, what kinds of positive effects are we looking for in the garden, and then what well-studied plant partnerships help us achieve that goal. Obviously, they, they have a wide range of beneficial effects and um, one of the things that I was really fascinated in the book was when, when you wrote about the nitrogen fixing plants um, can you tell me you know why we should be interested in these and maybe give a good example of one sure so we've often used 
cover crops, right? Farmers have used cover crops for years. They, they choose leguminous cover crops, which are members of the pea and bean family, because they have the very unique ability to, uh, to fix nitrogen, right? Which is take nitrogen from the air and, um, and fix it into a form that is usable to fuel plant growth. And they do that with a, through a relationship with a um, bacterial organism in their roots, right? In these nodules in their roots. So, it was known, you know, the farmers would till that leguminous cover crop into the soil. As it would break down, it would release the nitrogen, right? Well, a lot of home gardeners are hesitant to use cover crops in their garden. I don't think they should be, but many of them are. And so maybe they, they don't want to do a leguminous cover crop, but we can actually get the benefits of that nitrogen fixation and the, and the transfer of nitrogen over to plants while the two plant partners are in a living state. So... We are choosing a legume to partner with a non-leguminous plant. And that nitrogen transfer can happen also while the plants are in a living state. It happens through that underground fungal network that I mentioned earlier. It also happens as the um, nitrogen-fixing nodules on the roots of the leguminous plants as they sort of uh, die off, right? They, they shed from the plant. The roots will shed underground and that will be broken down by soil microorganisms and released to the neighboring plant. So it does actually happen without you having to grow a full lawn cover crop and till it into the soil. So one of my favorite plant partnerships to do that is green beans and potatoes. So green beans, they're a leguminous crop. Now, they are not; they don't fix a super amount of nitrogen, but they do fix a good amount of nitrogen. And that then can be transferred over to the potatoes. And there was some interesting studies that show that you actually have a larger tuber size on those potatoes when they're planted in combination with beans because of the greater amount of uh, available nitrogen to those potatoes. So that's a pretty cool combination. That's a really cool combination and maybe one that wouldn't make sense perhaps on the face of it because you assume that a crop that needs nitrogen is putting on a lot of leafy growth, whereas potatoes are putting on the growth under the ground. Exactly. So they use, you know, plants that produce tubers or even blooming crops tend to use a little bit more phosphorus, right? They require more phosphorus. But that doesn't mean that they don't need the nitrogen, right? They still need the nitrogen. In the case of potatoes, if you don't have good top growth, to support the production of the starches that help build that tuber underground, then you're not going to have a good potato set. So you do need that nitrogen to be available for those plants. But another combo for this nitrogen transfer that, you know, is a whole lot more logical for gardeners is the combination of garden peas and lettuce, right? They're both cool season crops. Lettuce is a green, so we know that it uses and requires a lot of nitrogen. And then, of course, the garden peas will help fix that nitrogen and provide it to that uh, that crop of lettuce. So that's a really good partnership that you can use as well. And it also works structurally, right, because the peas can grow up a trellis. They can get very tall, and then the lettuce can grow in sort of another layer down beneath, uh, really close to the ground. So you're making use of that vertical space in the garden, too. And what do the um, what do the nitrogen fixers get out of this? Do we know? <laughs> they get a space to live, right? <laughs> no, um, you know, there's not there's not much coming back to them in terms of nutrient transfer. So it's really sort of a, a one sided partnership in that regard. You know, they're they are the partner plant that is planted to give the benefit to the other plant. But then, of course, you know, we get to reap the benefits. We get to pick the peas. We get to pick the beans. Um, so that's always a good benefit to the gardener as well. Yeah, you mentioned that um, people are, are maybe a little bit resistant to plant cr- cover crops. And I think certainly I've come across that in my work, line of work. Um do you have any idea why that may, might be? I mean, off the top of my head, I think maybe it has something to do with the point where you dig them in. Um, but yeah, do you know why people are resistant to it? I think that you're spot on in saying that it's it's part of the digging in. You know, they see it as sort of a farm thing, right? That you need to have a plow and you need to have, you know, a tractor to be able to properly turn them into the soil. But the great part is if you do cover crop incorrect, you choose the right crop and you handle that crop properly, you don't actually ever even have to till it. I'm a no-till gardener. I haven't tilled my garden in almost 10 years. 
So, and I grow cover, cover crops, but I choose the right ones and I cut them down at exactly the right time. And then I just leave that debris on the surface of the soil um, rather than turn it in. And that then goes on to help control weeds as it breaks down. It then also adds organic matter and nutrients into the soil. So I think the stopping point for a lot of people is sort of the reputation of cover crops. Maybe they've struggled with them becoming weedy in the past because they didn't I hate to say this, but they didn't do it right. Um, and also they're worried about the, the chore of cutting them down and turning them in. But it really doesn't have to be a chore if it's done properly. Okay. Um, and the other interesting thing I found was that you talk about uh, companion plants as helping with weed control. So obviously we have that uh, situation where you harvest the cover crop and then you lay it down and then that acts as a weed suppressant and maybe we also have um, companion plants that could act as a living mulch and crowd out any weed seedlings are there any other ways that companion plants can help with weed control yeah well certainly so there are some cover crops out there that are allelopathic which means that they produce compounds either through their roots or through their foliage or both in some cases that inhibit and restrict the growth of other plants. And in particular, they can do this with seeds. So if you have a lot of weed seeds, so the, the weed seed bank in your garden is very high, choosing an allelopathic cover crop will help prevent those weed seeds from germinating. So oats, winter rye, um, those are cover crops that produce allelopathic compounds that can help limit the, the growth of weeds. So a lot of people then say, well, gee, why would I want to use those kinds of cover crops in the vegetable garden? Because aren't they going to prevent my vegetables from growing as well? Um, and what it, what it's shown is with the research shows that they're um, they're most active in inhibiting seed germination. So they are best used in places in the garden where we're growing from transplant. So you're planting a pepper transplant or a tomato transplant rather than sowing tiny radish seeds or tiny lettuce seeds into the garden. Um, they also are less effective with larger seeds. So you could still plant, say, your cucumbers or your squash um, from or your zucchini from seed because those are larger seeds and they are not going to be, um, you know, the germination on those is not going to be inhibited if you're going to use an allelopathic cover crop in that area. And it, they are great for weed control. And the other thing that you talking about the effect of plants one on the other, but in a, in a terms of a scent, uh, the, the scent of a plant, I think people have heard about carrots, carrots and onions. So maybe the smell of onions will confuse the carrot root fly. But you kind of bust that myth a little bit that it is the scent of the companion plant that's deterring pests. So can you just talk about, you know, what the research shows is actually happening? Yeah, this is interesting, right? Because everybody's always like, oh, you need to plant onions here because they don't like the smell of the onions and the onions are going to repel the pests. But that isn't, they think, what's happening. I mean, the, the jury is still out. There's still a lot of ongoing research in this. But what it looks like is happening is that the scent of the onions doesn't repel the pests. What it does is it masks the scent of the host plant. So a pest will find its host plant, so the place to lay eggs or the place to feed, through a set of cues. Sometimes they're visual cues, right? They actually see their host plant. But more often than not, it's volatile chemicals or, or essentially odors that that insect is looking for that allows it to hone in onto its host plant and discover it in the garden. When you plant that companion plant that is emitting another volatile chemical or odor into the air, that will mask the scent of the host plant. So it keeps, in some cases, can keep the insect from finding its host plant. So it's about masking. And many times that involves interfering with the egg laying behavior of the pest. So sometimes it's the pest actually munching on the leaves, but more often than not, it's the female who's looking for a place to lay her egg, the cabbage worm, you know, the, the cabbage butterfly that's looking for a place to lay her, her egg so that you get the little green cabbage worms. So that's the, that egg laying behavior is restricted when she can't find her host plant. Mm. Yeah, and it's a little bit of an aside, but it is to do with pests in the garden. Um, and I wondered if you could explain what a beetle bump is and why we might want one in our gardens. I am 
so glad that you brought this up, Sarah, because I love beetle bumps and I have done dozens of these interviews talking about plant partners and no one before has ever asked about them. So I'm, I'm really excited that you did. Um, they've been sort of in play in organic agriculture, in particular in Australia, certainly in some parts of Europe as well. And actually where we're doing a lot of research with them here in the U.S. is on the West Coast, like out in um, in the Pacific Northwest, in particular Oregon State University. Um, there's an entomologist there that, that's really looking into um, encouraging and encouraging the use of the creation of beetle. There they call them beetle banks because it's a really big area. It's a raised area that is um, on farms, they will do them in big, long rows, like a raised row. In a backyard, we'll call it a beetle bump because it might just be like a raised circular area where you build the soil up about 12 to 18 inches to create sort of this mound. And then you plant that area with bunch grasses. So these would be native grasses. So wherever in the world you live, you want to pick species of grasses that are native to where you live that form clumps and bunches rather than like running and spreading grasses. So here we might do the little blue stem and big blue stem. Um, and so, or, or some of the native panicum. So we might choose those. You would have different ones in the UK that you would choose, but you plant these bunch grasses on this raised beetle bump. And then that is a great habitat for brown beetles. And ground beetles are very predaceous. They eat a lot of ground-dwelling pests. They even climb up into our plants to eat a lot of pest larvae, like uh, asparagus beetle larvae. Uh, they eat slugs and snails on the ground level. There are lots of different species of them, but they like that sort of raised area. They love the habitat of the bunch grasses. So they spend the day in the beetle bump. And then at night, they go into the garden and they forage for all of these common pests that we face in our vegetable patches. And so just locating a beetle bump in the center of your vegetable garden or maybe just a few feet off of the periphery of the vegetable garden will increase the number of predaceous ground beetles and really help you control a lot of different pests and pest larvae in the landscape. It's really cool. Mm, it's ingenious. Does it ever harbor things like slugs as well? I think there is some extent of that that would take place. I mean, I believe it would naturally be a habitat that they would like as well. But I think that the goal here is, you know, never it's never to eliminate a pest. It's always to keep their numbers at a tolerable level. Um, and so when you do have a greater number of pest eating beneficials like those ground beetles, it balances each other out, right? They're there. And so they're never going to allow those slugs and other pests in that beetle bump even itself to get out of control because they're managing it. But you have to have some bad guys around, right? You have to have some pests around or else you won't be able to sustain that, uh, that constant population of beneficial insects. Yes, I agree completely. Um, so we've covered uh, the weed control properties. We've covered the plant nutrition benefits um, and also um, the scent issue. Um, I wondered if you could just talk about how companion planting can help combat plant diseases, because I think this is, I, I don't know about you, but I feel that this is the area where the scientific research really comes to the fore, um, because it's it's such an important topic. And also, um, I think probably it's something that maybe we haven't really understood before. Um, so yeah, how does how does it help combat plant diseases? Mm -hmm, it does. And it, it, what's interesting is that we're still learning about it. I would say of all of the fields of the sort of interplanting, companion planting, intercropping research that's going on um, right now, this is probably the field that's the least studied but has the most potential to be studied, um, at least in my research. I couldn't find the oodles of pay published papers on these partnerships like I could with pest control or soil health. Um, so I think the science is still emerging. But what's really neat is that um, it, it's in it's different ways that we think that these plant partnerships can help manage diseases. And in particular, it would be soil-borne diseases. So if we're growing, let's say, a cover crop in the area of mustard, um, the mustard can, can contain some antifungal compounds that will help condition the soil, help combat 
the negative um, bacterial or fungal issues that might reside in the soil. So it almost acts as like a fumigant for the soil, so to speak. In that case, it would have to be turned into the soil. So you would have to till uh, those mustard greens into the soil. But they do um, also help foster uh, good microorganisms in the soil. So the presence of certain cover crops being tilled into the ground can help encourage and enhance the microorganisms that are beneficial that feed on that decomposing organic matter and also limit the different bacteria and fungal that can affect the health of our plants. They, they can prevent a buildup of the pathogens in the soil. Um, you know, and, and there's other ways that, uh, that they can help reduce disease pressure in the garden as well. I mean, like the splash up effect. If you, you mentioned living mulches earlier when we talked about weed control, but living mulches around plants that get soil-borne diseases like tomatoes, for example, that get the blights that live in the soil. If we can plant around our tomato plants with a living mulch of something like, you know, crimson clover or white clover around the base of those tomato plants, that's going to limit the ability of those fungal spores to splash from the ground up onto the foliage of the plant because it puts a barrier there. So that can limit disease spread as well. So there's lots of different ways that we can use partnerships to help limit the uh, the amount of disease pressure we see in the garden. I've just been thinking back to what you said about using the um, grasses that are specific to an area in order to give shelter to the beetles on the beetle bumps. And um, you may or may not have looked into this, but I did wonder if there's any relationship between um, where a crop originates from and where the companion plant originates from in terms of the effect or does it just seem that you can kind of you can bung things in that would never meet in the wild and they still have good effects on each other yeah that's a really interesting question um it, it's one that i didn't come across any research uh, pointing to the differences or or similarities or effectiveness of a particular plant partnership based on where the each of the partners evolved um i think in the case of these agricultural crops, they've been domesticated for so long. Like the things that we grow in our vegetable garden, they have been domesticated. They've been bred, right? They're no longer in their wild form at all. Like a tomato today looks nothing like a, a wild native tomato did. So I think that there's been so much genetic change and mutations and breeding that have taken place over the years that I'm not really sure that you could effectively look at that um, unless you were looking at the original form of that wild plant. So I don't know, that would, be, that would be interesting to look and see if anything exists looking at that. I don't know if it does, but mm. yeah, yeah, an interesting question. Yeah. Um, and also I was wondering if you came across any plants that you um, that, that did work, plant partnerships that worked, but you still don't know why. Um, I think that there's certainly, mm, that's a really good question, Sarah. <laughs> the way Sorry. That you posed it was interesting as well. No, 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 it's great. I think it's great. Um, so my goal with plant partners was to really only present partnerships that had the science to back them up. It's not to say that other partnerships that maybe people have been using for generations and, and really think are effective. It's not to say that, you know, no, you can't plant those partnerships. They're definitely not going to work. But what I wanted to do was take the ones that definitely have the science behind them and present them together in a package that was really logical and easy to use for gardeners. So it's not to say that those other partnerships might not work. It's really to say that if you're going to do companion planting, maybe start with these ones that have the science to back them up. Makes sense. Perfect sense. Thank you. Um, and because it is such a, and well, it's, it is and it isn't a new area of research. It's new in terms of kind of looking at it through such a specific lens. Um, and you do mention that there is still much experimentation to be done. And I wondered if home gardeners can do anything and is there somewhere they can share their findings? Another excellent and thoughtful question. Yes, I mean, we definitely have a role to play uh, in these plant partnerships. And even if it's within our own space, so I always recommend to people, you know, start with the combinations that I suggest in the book that have science behind them. See which ones work for you. Keep a, a garden journal or notes on your computer or start a blog, right, where you're sharing this information with others, where you're, you're showing them your experiments and you're keeping track of 
what works for you and what doesn't work for you. Because we certainly know there are so many variabilities in gardening. I mean, we've got climate differences. We've got, you know, some years one pest is more bothersome than another pest. Some years, you know, some of us have better soil health going into this than those of us who might be starting brand new gardens and haven't had the opportunity to build up the health of our soil yet. So there's there's a lot of factors at play, a lot of variabilities that uh, variables that can come into play. So that's why careful note keeping is really essential in this. Um, you know, will our will what we record in our backyard make its way into a scientific paper and research? No, I, I don't think that that's going to happen. But does that mean it's any less valuable? No, I think that we could we could do a lot of our own sort of sleuthing and our own citizen science to really determine what works best in our space, and we shouldn't discount that. Um, as far as I know, there's really nobody that is collecting data from home gardeners on specifically on interplanting and, and intercropping and companion planting. Um, there certainly are a ton of citizen science projects in terms of in, uh, insects and phenology and um, you know, migration patterns and things like that that we can participate in. So maybe someday somebody will start something about um, these plant partnerships. But for now, there's nothing that I am aware of. Mm, that sounds like a challenge to people listening. Um, before I let you go, I was speaking to an amazing um, scientist in the last episode uh, who works for one of our tree research companies, who I believe has got an arm actually over in the States, a company called Bartlett Tree Experts. And um, I was speaking to Glyn Percival and he said um, he's noted that when he walks past um, a jasmine, this is kind of anecdotally, he finds that the plants in the vicinity of the jasmine grow really well. And he's looking specifically for things related to plant health, so pests and diseases and, um, you know, overall vigor of the tree. And that's something that he's found. Have you ever come across that? Hmm, that's really interesting. It's nothing that I've never, I've never noted anything like that myself personally. Um, but again, we do know that plants interact with each other in many different ways. So it would certainly be a possibility that they are influencing and impacting the way that the others grow, whether again, it's through the volatile chemicals that they release um, or through their root system, something that's being transferred from plant to plant. Um, I don't know. I couldn't speak to that combination specifically. Uh, it's something that I have not noticed, but I bet that there's scientists out there that are looking into it. Yeah, I think he will actually, because um, he's got a very curious mind. And um, so I might recommend your book to him. So he got somewhere to start. Well, excellent. Well, thanks for that. And thank goodness for all the curious minds out there, because I think that they are, they're moving everything forward, whether it's in gardening or the rest of the world. So keep being curious, I think. It's, it's a good lesson for everyone. Hurrah for Curious Gardeners and hurrah for Jessica. Her amazing book and her tireless work in promoting organic and wildlife-friendly gardening based on research and results. Thank you, Jessica, for talking about your book and thanks to you as well for listening. Please also go and check out this episode's sponsors, So and Mo. They're offering 15% off your first order. Visit soandmo.com or follow the link in the show notes and enter the code ROOTS15 at the checkout. Now, Dr Ian Bedford, with a very useful, albeit slightly cheeky, solution for ensuring you can grow a flower that many gardeners have simply given up on in recent years. Mention planting lilies in the garden and someone is bound to warn you about the dreaded red lily beetle. Ironically, lilies have relatively few pests, but this infamous little beetle has now become synonymous with growing true lilies and fritillaria. Adult lily beetles are recognised by their black bodies and bright, glossy red wing cases. They overwinter in the soil, emerging in late spring to search for their host plants, which they detect by smell from up to 30 metres away. After mating, the females lay small batches of orange eggs on the underside of leaves. These hatch into grubs that disguise themselves under a coat of slimy excrement as they voraciously consume the leaves from the tip back to the stem. When mature, the larvae enter the soil to pupate, hatching into the next generation of adults by midsummer. These again feed on the lilies and their flowers until autumn but don't mate or lay eggs until they emerge from hibernation the following year. 
Since the 90s, lily beetles have become widespread, and their ruthless attack on lilies have led many gardeners to stop growing them. Controlling lily beetles by hand is not so easy, since they're quite mobile, and when threatened, emit chemical alarm signals that prompt other beetles to quickly vacate the plants. Unfortunately, this has led to some gardeners using chemical pesticides that can also harm many of the pollinating insects that visit lily flowers. Interestingly, a new option is now available that involves spraying the lilies with a calcium-based solution. This doesn't harm the beetles or any of the beneficial wildlife, but simply creates an undesirable taste that encourages the beetles to go in search of untreated leaves. If using this option though, it makes sense not to tell all of your lily growing neighbours about it. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website rootsandall.co.uk. Please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support the podcast. Because if you enjoy the show, please help it continue. I also have a GoFundMe where you can make a one off donation. Even a one-off donation of £1 helps, and I'll be really grateful for your support. So please go to Patreon or GoFundMe and search for Roots and All Podcast.